welcome to Michigan Birding 101. This is our introductory birding series from Michigan Sea Grant um, that we offer, we've been offering for the last three years. We offer four classes in the spring. Um, so hopefully you were able to join us the spring and catch those. Um, there are recordings from our 2021 series online if you didn't, and we'll be offering it again next spring, probably in February, March. Uh, but today what we're here is to talk a little bit about fall birding. So uh, I, I'm really excited to have you all here and let's just dive right into it. So today you're going to see cool, get, get to see cool bird pictures. You're going to have fun. You're going to get a chance to answer questions. If I can get through this fast enough, we'll have lots of time for questions at the end. You're also going to be able to identify some key characteristics of fall migration in Michigan. So we're going to spend the first chunk of our time today talking about the amazing phenomena that is migration and particularly fall migration here in our Great Lakes State. And then we're going to wrap up with um, some bird identification skills. So we're going to actually do a bit of a recap from this last spring. And if you're new, um, this will be new for you then. Uh, if you have your binoculars and a field guide handy, that might be useful. Um, but if you don't, no worries. So let's dive right into it. Um, my name is Elliot Nelson, and I'm an extension educator with the Michigan Sea Grant program. Uh, we love this program. It's an awesome program. I'll talk a little bit about more, but I do a lot of aquaculture education. That's fish farms and hatcheries. I do K-12 education in the Eastern UP with my partners here at LSSU, Lake Superior State University. I do a bit of coastal tourism work as well, especially in the bird area. Um, and we also have joining us today, Cindy, who you just saw on here. She's our amazing communicator out of East Lansing. Uh, she's an editor, a digital program man manager, an all-around awesome person. Couldn't do this without her, so thank you for joining us today, Cindy. So Sea Grant, we're an organization that helps foster economic growth and protect Great Lakes coastal resources. We're all about economies and ecosystems, finding that balance there in our state of Michigan. We help bring science and research from universities to communities and from NOAA to communities and via conduit between research and education and community, um, community work. We're actually funded by NOAA and the University of Michigan and Michigan State University Extension. So we're really a three organizations that come together to run this program. We do research, education, and outreach in a variety of topics. Um, and we're all across the state. Uh, this is a little outdated map. Um, sorry about that, but we've got folks all across the state. So if you have a Great Lakes need or Great Lakes questions, I encourage you to check out your local Sea Grant contact or check out our website, michiganseagrant.org. All right, now you are all here. Some of you have been introducing yourself as well, but we'd love to hear where you're from. You know, we've got a lot of folks um, to, we've got a lot, a lot of folks here from Michigan, but maybe some from out of state too, or some seasonal folks that were moving around. But what's your name? Where are you from? And what have you seen this summer that was awesome? Go ahead and put that in the chat. We have a chat down at the bottom of your screen, the top of your screen, depends on how your screen set up, um, if you're using a phone or laptop or desktop, but you'll see a box that says chat and you can click that chat and tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you are from and uh, your name and location. I'm not seeing any chats right now. Oh, there we go. Okay. I was worried it wasn't working for a second there. All right. Somebody saw their first piping plover this summer on South Manitou Island, an endangered species. Our Great Lakes piping plover population is awesome. I got somebody here from Traverse City and their common grackles. They are such an, a wonderful bird. I love common grackles. They get a bad rap sometimes in the fall because they like to travel in huge flocks, but I love them. They're hunting around in the woods this time of year too. Um, Teresa for covert, welcome. Oh, somebody got to see Atlantic puff in Iceland this year. That is, I'm jealous. I want to see that. <laughs> uh, we've got some folks who've seen their rose-breasted gross beaks in their yard in Chicago area. Uh, we've got folks from all across the state, Saline, seeing the sandhill cranes this time of year. Uh, we got folks from Lennox seeing egrets. I love great egrets and cattle egrets. They're such beautiful birds. Um, some folks got to see ravens. Oh, uh, lacusta, leucistic, uh, or leucistic. Yes, uh, albino-like uh, raven. That's got to be really cool. I hear there's one like that hanging out in the Petoskey area. I think it's a crow. So we have a lot of you here from around the state. We had over 300 people register, got over around 100 here today. So we're really excited that you're joining us and you're here to learn a little bit more about birds. Feel free to keep popping in the chat there. I do wanna bring your attention to the Q&A box as well, which is next to the chat. And you can see our chat is going to be filled with all sorts of cool anecdotes, people sharing resources, telling us a little bit about themselves. If you have questions though, make sure that goes in the Q&A box. We'll miss it in the chat. So put your questions in the Q&A 
way and put your resources and fun facts and answers to my questions in the chat. All right, so questions in the Q&A and chatty stuff in the chat. All right, let's keep moving along here. Somebody was in the Galapagos and got to see penguins. What? I want to go hang out with all you folks <laughs> and go around the state, <clears throat> which actually I think we'll be offering some in-person birding trips this coming spring. So keep an eye out for that, too. We'll keep you on our list. But anyway, let's dive into it so we have enough time to get through everything tonight. So let's first talk a little bit about fall migration. This is a wonderful time of year. I am so excited. I've got like my sweaters ready to go. I've got pumpkin spice creamer in my fridge already. I am I am one of those people that loves the fall. And I love fall not just for all the kitschy uh, stuff and the Halloween fun times because it's my daughter's birthday season. Who she just celebrates for like the whole two months. Um, she loves this time of year too. Uh, but I love it because it's fall migration. And fall migration is one of the most diverse, dispersed, subtle, and yet spectacular things out there. So let's get into like a little bit more what I mean about diverse, dispersed, subtle to spectacular. But before we do that, I'm going to stop sharing and reshare here real quick. Um, Let's do a little quiz about some birds that you might see moving around since it's fall time here. And so um, I'm going to I'm going to go play the call and see if you can match up the call with the bird. And you might know some of these bird species. You can throw in the chat what they are if you want. Um, we've got A. This is one of our, our sparrows, the white-throated sparrow there. we got B. That one is the morning dove, a beautiful common bird. C, the American goldfinch. And D, the black-capped chickadee. So see if you can know what call this is. You can put your guess in the chat or you can just guess in your head. And let's play that call. I'm seeing lots of guesses, lots of guesses pouring in for D or, or what people are thinking here. And yes, that is the call of the black capped chickadee. So a bird that we don't think of as a migrant, really. But actually, there are small populations of, of chickadees that do migrate. In fact, this spring, I was at Whitefish Point and saw hundreds of chickadees fly around and actually land on my laptop. I had it out for work and it was an amazing experience. So chickadees do have partial migration. Some of their populations will migrate. By the way, if anybody knows a good bird tattoo artist, I'm looking to get my first tattoo. I really want it to be a good black cap chickadee. So if you know a good bird tattoo artist, this is totally shameless, um, self, self plug, uh, please put that in the chat so I can know who's a good tattoo artist in this area that can do a chickadee for me. But this is a bird that we don't think of as a migrant, but actually does migrate around a little bit as a partial migrant. We'll talk about that. And their call is no longer that that's more of their breeding season call. Now you're going to get some more of more often this kind of chickadee dee dee, the harsher call uh, this time of year. All right, let's do another one. This bird is A, B, C, or D. Quite the majestic call. Yeah, we got guesses flowing in here already. So I'll play this one more time. And as I do, uh, you know, we've got A as the northern cardinal, B is a Canada goose. C is a sandhill crane, and D is the blue jay. All of these birds have some kind of fall movement. Cardinals probably the least. They're quite resident. They don't migrate too much, but even cardinals will move around a little bit. The young have to find winter territories. B, the Canada goose, is definitely going to be migrating in big flocks already. C, the sandhill crane forms groups of thousands down in the Jackson area. And D, the uh, blue jays even do migrate too. We'll talk about that. But I see the answers are just rolling in here for C, the sandhill crane, one of my favorite fall migrants that has really puts on spectacular displays. Groups in the hundreds are around me now uh, up here in the Rudyard and Pickford areas in the farm field. So these are just a few, and, and, and this was just a quick review of, of how important sound ID can be. There's a great app called the Merlin Bird ID app we'll talk about later that can help you ID birds by sound. Um, but that's a really good key if you want to be a good birder. So let's talk a little bit about migration and why migration matters to us here in the Great Lakes and why it might even be um, significant that we're in the Great Lakes region. Well, first off, we are at the intersection of many what we call flyways. Now, a flyway is essentially a place that birds tend to generally fly through. And birds, particularly songbirds and raptors, don't really like to fly over water. And so when they get to the Great Lakes, it funnels them 
along the shorelines of our Great Lakes. You get these really high concentration of fall migrants at places like Whitefish Point and Point Pelee and McGee Marsh and Lake Erie Metro Park. Um, you know, all along our shorelines, you get birds that get bunched up to the shoreline that don't really want to cross. And they may cross at short crossings like, you know, Green Bay over to Escanaba or Whitefish Point up uh, south from Canada, um, you know, the Straits area. But these birds get really concentrated along the Great Lakes. And as you can see, we have birds that are migrating from Hudson Bay and along the East Coast that come through the Great Lakes, birds that are maybe up in the central plains of Canada that are going to come through the Great Lakes along the Mississippi Flyway. So we really have the Atlantic and the Mississippi Flyways both intersecting here, which makes us a great migration hotspot. Um, the birds that come through here, they help support us. I'll talk about this more next week. Um, but birds provide all sorts of amazing ecosystem services. They bring in seeds and help repopulate forests by pooping those seeds out. Well, they're, they're responsible for a large percent of the trees that we have around our state. Um, they're, they help re... Uh, take care of insect outbreaks and insect bursts that happen this time of year. As they come through, they'll feast on those and reduce pest populations. They provide all sorts of services, plus they're wonderful to look at and provide us a tourism opportunity. So we are a hot spot of fall migration here in the Great Lakes. And migration is just a, a mind blowing spectacle. Um, so this is a black pole warbler here. And I just wanted to stop for a moment to appreciate how insane it is that this thing migrates and how it migrates. So this bird is only about um, five inches long. So imagine this bird in your hand. It's a five inch bird, five inch long bird. It would fit in the palm of your hand. It only weighs 0.4 ounces. So that's like two quarters. So imagine this bird, it's got two quarters in your hand. You could probably barely feel it if it's in your hand. This bird is an obligate migrant. And so what that means is when the days get shorter, it's triggered by the length of a daylight that's out up in the Arctic tundra, up in the Canadian tundra. And this is um, a map here that shows some birds that they tagged with a little geolocator backpack. And you can see those birds are gonna migrate all the way when the time of day gets shorter, their cues kick in and they are mandatorily going to migrate all the way down to South America, all the way down to Venezuela for the winter. And just imagine that a bird that's five inches long, that weighs less than two quarters, is flying itself, not getting on an airplane, not getting on a bus like we would do, not getting on a boat. It's literally just using its own body to lift up into the air and fly two. 20,000 kilometers. And the crazy part is it's going to do that this fall. They're moving through right now, just flying over our heads, billions of birds. And in the spring, it's going to do the whole thing all over again. And it's going to do it again and back and forth. It is an insane thing, spring migration and fall migration, that it even exists. The fact that these tiny little organisms relative to us uh, can make these impressive feats of movement every single year. And they do this so that they can get resources um, because there's a bunch of extra resources in the Arctic in the summer when all the bugs hatch. And there's nice warm resources for them down south in the winter. But really just an incredible feat migration is. And this is an example, a good example of an obligate migrant. Um, and this isn't just a few birds that we're talking about. Um, this is a migration forecast from the BirdCast website, which is part of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And you could see this is from um, tonight. It's predicted pretty good uh, migration. I don't know if you can see that number there, right, there, but it says 281 million birds predicted to be migrating tonight. 281 million birds in one night. That's one night of migration. And we're actually in the early part of fall migration. So that number could increase to literally billions of birds flying over our country in one single night. So not only is it insane that these birds are so tiny and that they can get themselves across entire continents, but there are literally billions of them flying over us. In fact, last night, this is um, from Migration Cast, um, these, these numbers come from basically Doppler radar. Radar. There's so many birds in the air that Doppler radar can actually pick them up. So right now, last night, there were six million birds flying over Michigan last night. Um, that's almost as many people that we have in the state that were just in flight migrating in one night. That doesn't even count the resident birds, and that doesn't count all the birds that don't migrate at night, which are things like waterfowl and raptors and big cranes and, and herons. Only about like half of the bird species migrate at night. So 
even if you calculate that, it's probably double that. 12 million birds are actually migrating more than the people uh, in this state. It's just really a mind-blowing fact. And again, these are what we call typically obligate migrants um, that are migrating around. So uh, just wanted to point out that migration is magnificent. It is truly spectacular. And to me, I think we don't appreciate how truly insane it is that these tiny little creatures that weigh almost nothing are able to come, um, you know, go through hurricanes and high winds and lightning storms and get themselves across a continent every single year, twice a year. Um, now, not all birds migrate at night, as I just referenced, and not all birds migrate based on um, internal cues. Some birds, like the canvasback, will migrate based on resources. So this is some pictures from Justin Labadee. I, I, I took these off of Facebook. I hope he doesn't mind. <laughs> but I just wanted to show you how insane and impressive migration can be. Um, sometimes we miss the subtle migration of night flights over our heads. We don't hear these birds. We don't see them. It's at night. Um, waterfowl, though, are not subtle. <laughs> they migrate based on when resources are available often. So they may start moving south as it gets cold, and they may move from point A. You know, that black pole warbler, he's going to move from point A to point B every year. He's got point A, point B, and moves like clockwork. These birds, they might move from point A in the UP to point B in the northern lower peninsula. And as it gets colder and maybe ice starts forming that or they're going to move to point c in saginaw bay and then they might move to point d in lake erie and if it's a really cold year by december they may even have to move south from michigan but if it's a warmer year they might stay in lake erie all winter and this is right in lake erie uh, in january but these birds will start congregating by november so really, um, these these canvas backs will be there in the groups of tens of thousands of birds. And I've stood in Lake St. Clair Metro Park is another good place to see these um, the aphia ducks and their magnificent migration. When you see 10,000 birds take up into the air and move around you and you can feel the vibrations in the air, you, you feel connected to the earth and you feel connected to this migration in a way that I, I really encourage you to get out there. Go to Lake Erie Metro Park or to Lake St. Clair Metro Park this late fall because fall migration really goes all the way into winter for these waterfowl and experience this. It, it's a really amazing um, experience. And, and those are called facultative migrants. So these are migrants that might move from point A to B to C, maybe to D or E, depending on the environmental conditions. Then you have things like blue jays, something that we think of as not as a migrant, right? Blue jays are one of the most common birds around in the eastern U.S. They're a very gregarious, loud, and bright and beautiful bird. They have this beautiful blue pigment, which is actually not um, a pigment from absorbing light. It doesn't absorb light and re-emit it, and rather it reflects light through a specific protein structure um, that creates blue reflections off of their, their feathers as opposed to re-emitting. But anyway, I'm getting to the weeds there. Uh, <laughs> I just think they're really cool birds. But look at this migration map. This is an animation here that shows different times of the year. It's going to kind of move along. And the darker the color, the different um, density of bird, uh, blue jay reports. And you can see that in the fall, you get this surge. And these are the young a year birds. But you can also see that in the spring, they're moving. Blue jays actually migrate. Even though we think of them as a non-migratory bird, big portions of their population do migrate. And you can go up to Whitefish Point this fall and you can literally see three, 400 blue jays during the day swarming around, guiding the warm air thermals up. And then a hawk will come in and all of a sudden 120, 150 blue jays will come down and land in the trees around you. And they go whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. It's a really fun experience. Um, but it's magnificent to see blue jays, a bird that we don't think of as migratory. Really, they are migratory, at least large chunks of their population. And these are called partial migrants. Um, these are birds where maybe some of their population won't migrate, but others will. So even our common backyard birds like chickadees, uh, blue jays, robins, and cardinals that we maybe don't or maybe not robins, but cardinals, blue jays, chickadees that we don't think of as migratory, parts of their population are migratory. And there's so much we still don't understand in the science of migration um, that it's really important that we pay close attention to these common birds because even some of the most common backyard birds, we don't really understand their migratory behavior. These birds may go from A to Z and hit half of the alphabet in their locations any year. And they may migrate east or west based on drought or food availability. Um, so there's a lot of, of different um, 
things. Oh, this quote is great. All aspects of blue jay migration remain poorly understood, although two general patterns are clear. Some individuals are pre usually present year round throughout the range, and at least some individuals depart during spring throughout the range, except from Florida, the golf course. So really, like there is there's so much still that we don't understand about migration. Um, you know, speaking of migration and fall migration here, we've got a lot of these little warblers moving around right now. And, and there's a lot of great research and I, I helped run a migration and vagrancy class. And Dr. Jen Owens from uh, Michigan State University, she runs the Michigan Bird Observatory. Um, she taught me a lot more about migration and what it is that kind of is the, the navigating or the ways that birds use cues to navigate. Um, one of those is visually. So birds have pretty acute eyesight. Um, they're pretty, pretty good at seeing things and stars and the sun and landscape, things like ridges and, and rivers. Um, those will be visual cues that birds will follow. Um, and yes, the stars are part of that, which is why it's really important, especially in the spring and fall, to turn off your lights at night because light pollution can really disrupt migration. We'll talk about that more next week. Um, they can also feel the Earth's magnetic uh, waves, or they can they have an inner ear uh, that has iron in it and can actually use magnetic waves. Uh, and so they can actually use a, an internal compass, a literal internal compass, magnetic compass to help them navigate. And one other thing, I read some research that shows that some birds even use smell to migrate. So they actually follow their nose, right? The old toucan saying, <laughs> uh, follow their nose to figure out where they are migrating to next. So it's a pretty incredible um, feat. Again, it's a, just a magnificent thing. And the more you learn about the migration of birds, I think the more impressive it becomes. All right, uh, seeing some good stuff in the chat. Sorry, I just dropped my mouse there, but uh, we're all back here now. So uh, what a beautiful bird the Kirtland's warbler is. Yes, I didn't even mention what these three species were here. Uh, so we've got uh, the Connecticut warbler on the left there with the white eye ring. Um, this is a bog forest. Oh, I do have them labeled there. A the Tennessee warbler in the middle there. I actually saw a Tennessee warbler hanging out right along the river in Grand Rapids downtown last week, a couple of weeks ago. Um, some birds are migrating pretty early this year. It's a little unusual, um, but they're a beautiful, wonderful boreal species. And of course, our Kirtland's warbler, our local um, specialty here in Michigan, a rare endangered species or recently endangered. All right, now fall migration is very diverse. So we, kind of, we just sort of set the stage about, you know, there are different kinds of migratory birds, obligate, facultative, partial. Um, you know, migration itself is an amazing feat to get resources and for birds to be able to optimize resources in different locations. Um, but fall is particularly cool because it is the most diverse migration we have. So there are 405 species reported in fall in Michigan compared to 392 in the spring and 361 one in the summer and 276 in the winter. Apologize for that typo there. Uh, but fall migration is really the most diverse migration we have. We have the most species coming through. In fact, we even have some species that don't migrate in uh, the spring through Michigan, but do come through in the fall, like Baird Sandpiper and um, Connecticut Warbler seem to be more obvious in the winter. We have 30, or in the fall migration, uh, we have 30 species of warblers that migrate through Michigan, at least 30 uh, in any given year, which is really cool. There's that Connecticut warbler, one of my favorite. Um, we have three months of waterfowl migration plus. Waterfowl start migrating now and they will keep migrating as resources change throughout the winter all the way into December. Maybe even you consider January part of their fall migration still. So many months of fall migration. It's a long drawn out migration season, which is nice because spring migration is like May, maybe a little bit of April, and that's it. You got to jam it all in. But fall, you get a lot more time. And like I said, there's some fall exclusives. Um, redneck grebes migrate through uh, Whitefish Point in much bigger numbers in the fall, where they go over to Georgian Bay to spend some time um, in the winter before they're heading off to the Atlantic coast. And ba Baird Sandpiper up there at the top is a beautiful little sandpiper that is completely absent in the spring. Its migration path does not go through Michigan in the spring. It's a very rare bird. There's almost no records of it in the spring, but lots of records in the fall. Another beautiful one, the buff-breasted sandpiper. If you head out to a lakeshore, you might get lucky enough to see one of those beauties. 
So it's a it's a very diverse migration. Um, you've got everything moving through, and it's a very drawn out migration. It's dispersed, as I was saying. So you can expect um, fall migration to go all the way from July. We actually had shorebirds, um, like sandpipers, starting to migrate through in July through the end of November. You could really even argue into December for waterfall. Um, raptors are kind of going to be coming through now through September. I'll talk a little bit more about raptors in a minute. Um, shorebirds are also primarily in August and September migration. Um, so August and September, you can kind of see are some of the key times, like late August and September. Um, but some shorebirds will keep migrating into October too. Um, some of our songbirds like tanagers, vireos, flycatchers, and orioles, those are August and September migrants primarily. So they're some of our earlier ones. Now warblers typically start maybe in late August, but really start going in September and October. So warblers are a little bit later. They keep going through October, things like orange crowned warbler and others, um, yellow rumped warblers will migrate all the way through October, maybe even into early November. Um, waterfowl, they tend to not start until too much until September. And like I said, they are uh, more facultative migrants. So they're gonna keep migrating as it gets colder all the way through November, maybe in December. Sparrows are some of our other late migrants. I love going out in October to see big flocks of white-throated sparrows and white-crowned sparrows and chipping sparrows. Um, they're just moving around in huge numbers with all their young. Uh, and, and once all those more flashier birds have left by the end of September, like the tanagers and vireos, that were, were left with the, the sparrows. But I think they're a really underappreciated group. And November and October are great months to see them. And blackbirds are some of the other later migrants. They, they're going to be moving around in huge flocks. So you can see there's many times to birds, many opportunities to get out and bird in the fall migration season here. Um, some of fall migration is just truly mind-blowing spectacular, like those canvas backs I showed you, the pictures of 10,000 ducks in the air on Lake Erie or Lake St. Clair at the same time. Um, you know, those Crane migration is truly spectacular. And if you're looking for a good place, um, Crane Fest is happening this year, October 14th and 15th, down in the Jackson um, or Battle Creek area. It's sponsored by the Battle Creek Kiwanis Club, the Hanley Nature Sanctuary. sanctuary. It's kind of between Battle Creek and Jackson. And um, there's a few, another place in Jackson that has a great sanctuary. You can also come up here to the UP or any really farm field. And if you have good hay fields in particular, which are more diverse and provide more food for cranes, and things like corn and soy, um, those fields are going to be chock full of these big, beautiful cranes. Sandhill cranes are like over three feet tall. They're just magnificent um, dinosaur-like birds. When you get close, they really do look like dinosaurs. I highly encourage you to check out Crane Fest if you haven't before. The other one that's another spectacular migration, and this is actually a hawk migration that is very concentrated. And these are probably more obligate migrants. These are called broadwing hawks, and they move through in the fall in huge numbers in ways that they don't necessarily move through um, in the spring, particularly along the Detroit River. So the Detroit River Hawk Watch is a great nonprofit group that counts broadwing hawks, and they have had days in at Lake Erie Metro Park. Uh, where they have counted tens of thousands of hawks in the air at the same time. Yes, tens of thousands of hawks, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 plus hawks in the air at the same time. To give you a sense of what that looks like, I wanna play this video. It's actually from South America, um, but it's the same species, the same kind of spectacle. And just look at that. These hawks, what they're doing is they're riding warm air thermals during the daytime. And I said, they don't like to cross water. So they will ride these warm air thermals up, up higher and higher. And and as they go throughout the day, masses of more and more hawks to the point I've only seen about five or six thousand in a swarm before, but even that is just mind blowing. These are big birds, these are hawks. Um, and so, in some places, they can be up to tens of thousands um, swirling up through the air at the same time. And if you hit Lake Erie Metro Park on the right day this fall, um, you may actually get to witness that, that truly mind blowing, awesome um, experience. Now, Fall migration, like I said, is spectacular, and there is um, there is a lot of really cool um, spectacles. But fall migration is also subtle. A lot of birds, like our warblers, are really brightly colored in the spring, but not so much in the fall. They don't have to worry about attracting a mate anymore. They're not putting on that flashy color for show to prove, show their fitness and be chosen as a mate um, for a potential female. They're all just going to be a little more drab. So. Um, 
fall migration is a good time to really work on your ID skills and really kind of move away from just being dependent on single field marks and color and start focusing more on structure and pattern. All of these warblers look the same, except they're just subdued way down from what they look like um, in the spring. So, uh, you know, this is a good uh, guide from the Peterson Field Guide. It's a really good way to learn your fall warblers. And we'll talk next week a little bit more about fall ID, but I just want to point out there that fall migration is a bit more subtle. You know, it's not that concentrated into spring, like really the one month of May that is just a blitz of uh, migration as all the birds are rushing up to their breeding territories. It's a bit more subtle and slow. And I think I like that. I like that pace. And I like some of that challenge personally. I, I think I pick fall migration over spring. A lot of birders might throw me to the wolves for that, but um, I really love fall migration. If you're looking for good places to go um, uh, look at birds this fall, there's some choices for you here. I'm just going to point out some of my favorite hotspots. Um, so up in the UP, we have um, Brockaway Mountain up in the Copper Harbor. First off, Copper Harbor in the fall is probably one of the most beautiful places in the world to see fall colors. Um, there's a mountain up there, Brockway Mountain, and you can stand on that mountain and be at eye level with hawks. It's known more for its spring migration, but fall is absolutely excellent there too. And Whitefish Point is another just beautiful place right on the shores of Lake Superior. You can see where that uh, pin is and it's a short crossing there. Same with the Keweenaw, it's a shorter crossing from Isle Royale to Keweenaw. And this is where birds get concentrated and really rare things show up there too. It's a great place to check out. Um, the, the, some of the other ones, the Mackinac Strait Raptor Watch down in the Straits, that's ha taking place right now. There's people there counting birds. You can go say hi to them. They're at um, Point La Barbe in St. Ignace this year, counting hawks. And also monarch butterflies, um, they're counting there. And there's quite a few coming through right now as they also migrate. Um, another little known secret, my friend Sky would kill me if he saw that I'm broadcasting this kind of hidden gem here, but Peninsula Point is by Rapid River, Michigan in the UP. And you can see it kind of stretches out closer to the Green Bay and the Dork um, Peninsula. And so this is another place that birds are crossing. I was just there in that area. I saw white pelicans flying by. I saw a huge number of um, warblers. And a few years ago, I saw hundreds of mo monarch butterflies coating um, the trees there. And it's a really cool place. You can stand up on that lighthouse and be at eye level with the warblers as they fly by. Um, Lake St. Clair Metro Park and Lake Erie Metro Park are awesome places to go this time of year and all the way through late November. And these are places that have huge concentrations of waterfowl and also impressive hawk migration. And Muskegon Wastewater, let's not forget Southwest Michigan has some awesome birding opportunities too. Muskegon Wastewater, yeah, birders are weird. We like going to wastewaters and landfills uh, <laughs> because that's where there's a lot of birds. And that is a really cool place. You can get a permit to go um, birding throughout the wastewater. And I have seen more bird species there added to my leaf list, I think, than almost anywhere else in the state of Michigan, maybe the exception Whitefish Point. Um, so it's a really cool place. Also, if you're looking for birding trails, um, these are trails that are driving trails. And they tell you where to go bird. And we they're all community driven efforts. We've got some new ones like the Shore to Shore Trail and the Lake um, St. Clair Macomb Birding Trail. And these birding trails um, have websites that tell you all the places you can go birding. So if you're looking for a local hotspot or you're headed out on a trip, check out the Michigan Audubon website. They have links to all of these. Um, it's right there, michiganaudubon.org slash go birding. And we will share these resources too with you after our uh, meeting tonight, the next few days. So you don't have to worry about scrambling all this down. All right, so that is uh, fall migration in a blast there, about 30 minutes. And um, I hope that kind of got you a little excited about going out to some of these amazing places to see some of these incredible spectacles. If you have questions, don't forget to put them in the Q&A. If they're in the chat, we're gonna lose them. So definitely please put them uh, in the Q&A. And um, I, I wanna move on now because if Elliot, you're excited to- did, did, yeah. Do you wanna answer a couple of questions about sure, fall Sure, we can do a few first. really quick. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, Rebecca has said she's in the Saginaw Bay area and, yeah. uh, was wondering if where right. migratory birds happen in there. Yeah, so, uh, Saginaw Bay. Well, you can check out the Saginaw Bay birding trail, but that is an incredible place for migration too. It gets huge concentrations of waterfall. You can go to Bay City State Park. Um, that's right on the bay there. And that has some awesome places to bird. The Shiawashi National Wildlife Refuge, they have a driving trail it closes pretty soon and actually does close for hunting. So you can't do too much birding there in the fall, but check out their uh, schedule. They may be open for a few more days um, here. I think they close sometime in September. Uh, there's also um, a plethora of other places, Nyaquin, 
um, state wildlife areas up on the north end of the bay. And on the south end of the bay, you have Fish Point State Recreation Area. So definitely go to the Saginaw Bay Birding Trail and you're going to see all these places listed out for you. It is a great migration. There's really no bad spots to be in Michigan in fall migration. <laughs> Everywhere has potential. Hey, should we be turning off our outside lights now? Yes, you should. Um, really at night, it's best to turn off your outside lights if you don't need them. I know we're all scared of the dark. It's terrifying. Uh, but when you're not outside, you know, turn those lights off. So if you've got a permanent light that's always on, really consider putting it on a timer or a switch um, so that when you're not outside, it can be off. Um, you could also use motion sensing devices. That way you don't even have to worry about turning it on and off. It'll just automatically do that for you. But yeah, light pollution is really a, a increasing problem for birds. And so the more you can do to turn off your lights at night, um, the better. And many towns Towns and communities, um, even Detroit, have started to participate in lights out programs where they encourage office buildings to turn off all their lights at night. It saves you money. It doesn't waste electricity and it helps the bird. It's really a win, win, win. The only downside is that it will be dark and I guess dark is scary. But <laughs> Val wants to know, she saw a, blue, saw a blue bunting for the first time this year. Are they common in Michigan or, or was wondering if it was migrating? Yeah, so um, they're a blue bunting. Technically, that's the common name of a species that would not be in Michigan. <laughs> that's an incredibly uh, rare bird for the U.S. in general. I think it's down in New Mexico. But an indigo bunting is probably what you saw. And indigo buntings are a, a bird that migrates up into Michigan in the spring and then um, actually leaves again in the fall. And they are a, a a fairly common summer bird and a great migrant to see. And the females are completely drab. We also have blue grosbeak, which is a rare bird for Michigan, more common downstate, um, but in the lower, lower part of the state, <laughs> starting to breed in certain areas. But blue grosbeaks are another really cool bird you might get lucky to see in Michigan. Liam says, I know that sometimes during winter we get uh, snowy owls, but do any of our year round owl residents migrate? Yes, yes, we definitely have owl migration. And the Whitefish Point Bird Observatory is a great place to go and learn about owl migration because they actually banned owls there and have been in some of the folks that have really taught us about owl migration, which is really an unknown kind of thing. So we have many species of owls in Michigan. Some of our migratory species are things like northern saw wet owls, the super cute little owl um, that actually moves south in the winter quite quite consistently. And you can be found more in the lower peninsula in the late fall and winter months. Um, Long-eared owls are a bird that's pretty nocturnal but they actually form groups in the winter and they will hang out in day roofs. So if you're lucky enough to find a long-eared owl, you may actually find several all together. Um, you know, I remember seeing a group of those at Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge, a really cool experience. Um, Short-eared owls are another owl and these ones like to come out around dusk. So I've seen them down in the fields around Ann Arbor, the, the farm fields just north of there. I've seen them up in my area and they're another migratory species. They will move south in the fall as well. And if you go out this time of year now, and especially over the next two months, um, in dusk time, you may see them with their very moth-like flight. They have this very tippy, kind of almost like they're a moth flying with these rounded wings. So yes, owls do migrate. Um, you know, short-eared owls, long-eared owls, northern saw-wet owls, um, they're all going to be moving around this time of year. I'm going to ask one more question before we move on to the rest of the presentation, but what do 10,000 hawks find to eat when they're migrating? <laughs> That's a great question. So a lot of birds um, tend to store up a lot of fat before migration starts. So what a lot of birds will do is feast throughout the summer, especially after the young um, are kind of fledged. They'll really try to gather up as much fat reserves on their body as possible. And then when they start migrating, they may actually not stop and eat for a long time. They may, there is um, a lot of good studies that are starting to come out where they, again, put these geolocators on birds. And sometimes what they'll find is a bird may migrate for hundreds of miles before it actually stops and takes a break and maybe finds a spot to feed. So a lot of these birds are not feeding as they go. They're using their fat reserves. And certainly 10,000 birds aren't going to find too much in one area. But I will say places like Whitefish Point, um, sharp-shipped hawks are flying around all the time. And those 
um, Blue Jays are flying around in the hundreds, and a lot of Blue Jays end up uh, as hawk bait in that kind of in that kind of scenario. So those concentrated points will be places where birds are feeding sometimes, and you can see quite a bit of carnage sometimes. But um, <laughs> they also will just often just build up those fat reserves ahead of time and make those long stretches of the journeys without stopping to eat. All right, well, let's keep going. We'll come back to the questions at the end. So do, those are great questions. Thank you, folks. Remember, put those in the Q&A. We're gonna miss your questions in the chat. So if you're putting questions in the chat, go ahead and put them in the Q&A too. Um, and also do feel free to keep sharing resources. I love that Cindy's scrambling and finding these links for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and you know, I also see some folks sharing some cool resources there. Um, Ottawa County Parks has hosted some sandhill crane stuff too. So that's really cool. Um, so do please keep sharing stuff in the chat and do keep putting your questions in the Q&A. Let's keep moving on. So what we're going to talk about now is if you're excited about all this fall migration and you want to go see it, let's remember how to see birds and ID birds with a quick refresher from our earlier spring stuff on how to use your equipment, your field skills, and your resources. So let's dive right in. Remember how to use your binoculars. So if you have binoculars with you here, we're going to do a quick recap on how to use them. And just a, a reminder about the diopter and how to adjust with those. So what you wanna do when you're using your binoculars is first just get comfortable using them. So if you're new to birding, there's a good recap or um, a good uh, intro. And if you've been birding a bit, it's a good reminder. It's always good whether you have a long standing pair of binoculars or a new pair of binoculars to test them out before you go out birding, make sure everything's working. And what you wanna do is you wanna raise your binoculars and you wanna use the center dial here um, you want to use the center focus to adjust until things become clear. So I'm going to look out at my, about 10, 15 feet away out of my office here, and I'm going to adjust until things are clear. Now, things look pretty clear, um, but you might end up seeing two uh, images or you might see black rings around your images. And in that case, you may need to adjust the hinge on your binoculars so that it's the appropriate distance for your space of your eyes, because everybody's eyes are different space. So if you have your binoculars with you, um, go ahead and adjust your binoculars with the focus so it's clear and then the hinge so you see a single image without um you know without any distortion so that's the first thing you want to get your hinge set right and you want to focus then you can actually adjust your diopter so most binoculars have a diopter which is where one of your um objectives can actually be specifically focused just for the right so what you do for that is you look at an object and you cover up the right barrel and you adjust the center focus till it's clear. So you're just looking through the left and you want it to get nice and clear. All right, now I'm gonna go through this fast because this is kind of a recap from our spring. Um, but remember, you can always take this recording later, slow it down and go through this. But again, after you focused with just the left barrel, you're gonna cover up the left barrel and just look through the right barrel, okay? You're just gonna look through the right barrel. And I'm gonna stop sharing here so you can see this. So you're just gonna look through the right barrel, but instead of using the center focus, you're going to use the diopter and you're gonna adjust that until the right um, lens is in focus. So I'm gonna adjust mine cause it got bumped and it got off and mine's not in focus anymore. And voila, I am now seen clearly out of the left and the right. Uh, if you have, uh, you may have to pop this up. If for some binoculars, you got to pop it up to be able to adjust, or it may just adjust. And I always find it good to check your diopter because it, when you're out in the field, you can bump your binoculars around uh, and they can kind of mess up that diopter. And you really want to have a nice clear focus with both, um, both barrels of your binoculars. So that's thing one, learn how to use your binoculars, play around with them, adjust, kind of practice looking around with them. Um, but here's the next thing. When you're using your binoculars, a common pitfall that people often do is that they want to find the bird really fast. And so if somebody's like, oh, look, there's a bird up there in that tree, they'll look up at the tree and they'll instantly raise their binoculars and they'll start looking around like this. And they'll be like, ah, I can't see anything. And now I'm dizzy. Oh, that actually made me a little dizzy. <laughs> uh, so what you want to do is as long as the bird is within, you know, a few hundred feet, even like a hundred yards, um, you should be able to see that bird first with your eye, your naked eye. So if I see a bird up in the tree, I'm told there's a bird at the tree. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find that bird with my naked eye. You might be able to see a little bit of movement if it's moving around, if it's a bigger bird, hopefully you can pick it out. And once I see that bird, I want to note what's around it. 
Okay, I want to note that, that maybe in this case, this bird this is a tropical kingbird that was a rare bird up here in the fall a few years ago, Chippewa County. I might see that this bird is on top of the tree and I might note that that shape of that spruce tree. Then what you're going to do is keep your eye in the birdie. Never move your eye off the bird. Don't look down at your binoculars. Don't look at your bird book. Just keep your eye on the bird and raise your binoculars up and you should be, voila, looking at the bird. So again, you find the bird with your naked eye, notes what's around it, lift your binoculars up and you should be looking at the bird. Now, if that bird happened to move and you know what tree it was on, you could know, okay, I'm looking where it was. I can't see it. I'll lower my binoculars, look for it again, or maybe I'll just look down the tree to make sure it didn't just hop down that tree. So getting the kind of perspective of what's around you. But again, the goal here is find the bird with your naked eye first, then lift your binoculars up. This is for birds that are, are relatively close. For birds that are really far away, or if you're scanning a distant shoreline, it's fine to just raise your binoculars up first. But for birds that are close, especially songbirds and things like that, that's what you're gonna wanna do. All right, so we quick crash course on how to use your binoculars, quick crash course on how to find a bird in your binoculars. Now, uh, once we see that bird, what are we gonna do? What are our skills gonna be here? Um, they, the main thing what happens when you see a bird is that you want to watch it as long as possible. So birds move around, right? Um, birds are moving all over the place. Um, and you might not have a lot of time to uh, look at that bird. And, and a common mistake I used to make all the time is that I would see a new bird and I wouldn't know what it was. So I would instantly lower my binoculars and grab my bird book and start flipping through and like look up at the bird and look up, flip through the book and then look up and the bird's gone. And then I'm trying to remember what that bird looked like, but I only looked at it for a second before I got my bird book out. And now I can't remember what that bird looked like. And now I'm never going to identify it. So when you see a bird, take as much time as you can to observe the bird. And we'll talk about what features to look for. After you've fully observed that bird, noted things um, that we'll talk about here, then you want to, if you can, take some notes. Maybe take a picture too. If you've observed it for a while, you get a chance to take a picture or just jot down notes about what you saw. Do this before you open your bird book, because once you open your bird book, your mind's going to start automatically making assumptions about what you saw and trying to just sort of connect the dots. Um, but minds are fickle things. We lose our memories very fast. Our short-term memories don't hold information for very long. So writing down what you saw will be a helpful tool before you open your field guide. And then lastly, you would open your field guide and start looking for what you saw. So we're going to practice this. This is a bird right here. I don't want you to say what it is. Don't put it in the chat. But what I want you to do is observe this bird and put some observations. When you're looking at a bird, here's a list of things you can look for. Structure. This is different than size, right? This is maybe structure. So this bird has, well, I'll let you give me some uh, thoughts on what it has. Pattern. I'm not saying color necessarily. Color can be deceptive, but patterns are, are striking. And then um, behavior, relative size. So if you know a known object, uh, next to it, or maybe relative size, like is that bird's bill longer than its head or shorter than its head? How long is the tail compared to the length of the wings or to, compared to the length of the body? Um, those relative things when comparing the bird to itself. So start putting some observations uh, in there. And uh, let's see. So we don't need to guess what it is yet, but I'm glad we got some guests. We've got a white breast. So that's one thing. Long beak, right? So a very, and a narrow beak. It's a pretty narrow beak. It's open. Yeah, the body is definitely shorter than, or the tail is definitely shorter than the wings. That's a good observation there, Sarah. It's a very two-tone. That's a great note on that pattern, right? The whole bottom is bright and the whole top is darker. It also has that kind of two-tone on the top with the black cap and a lighter colored back. So that's a great observation there, Holly. Uh, uh, a few other things is a rounded belly. Yeah, it has a rounded belly. It also has what I would call, you know, an elongated, um, an elongated body shape. Uh, no eye ring. That's a good one too. Eye rings and wing bars are very distinct patterns that are only on some birds. So those are really good things to look for. Look at the eye ring. Look and see if there's wing bars. This bird has almost no wing bar, maybe very, um, maybe very subtle, just a little bit. And so you all are getting good at this. This is good observations. Now, we can't really probably say too much about behavior or location or habitat, but we'll show a video later where you can, you can put key in on behavior. All right, so these are some good observations. Now, once you've had your observations and you've written them down, um, you know, then you, you want, 
you, we took our observations, we took our notes. A bunch of you have contributed. Thank you so much for sharing your observations in here. And the next is to consult your field guide. Now this is where it gets tricky, right? There are over 800 species of birds in North America. If you have an Eastern field guide, it may have four or 500 species in there. Um, a Western field guide, you know, might have the same amount or more. Um, so what you wanna do is kind of start to get familiar with your field guide about what species groups there are. And once you kind of start to learn the groups like sparrows, warblers, um, uh, you know, vireos, tanagers, blackbirds, you can kind of start to key in as to what group these birds might belong to. Woodpeckers, that's probably a group that you already know really well, right? So does anybody know what group of birds this belongs to here? You could put that in the chat if anybody knows. What group of birds, what type of bird is this? Maybe not the specific species, but he guesses. This is a weird looking bird, right? It's kind of got a long stretched out body. It's almost woodpecker like, but it doesn't quite have that heavy big bill or that horizontal structure. Well, I'm not seeing any guesses. So I'm just, oh, there we go. Wendy got it. This is the a nuthatch. So wren was a good guess too. Wrens have very short tails. Warbler's not exactly right because warblers are a little more skinny and drawn out with longer tails. Um, but um, nuthatch is what this is. So if you look in your book, you'll see that there are only a few different kinds of, of nuthatches. Um, and here's actually two kinds. I'm not sure why I put two up here. <laughs> but um, these, these nuthatches, these are a group of different nuthatches here. Um, but now when you get your book open, you'll see there are really only about um, five, four species of nut hatches and throw the brown creeper in there with them. So these are the nut hatches of North America. And now you're probably able to pick out what species we had originally there. And there are actually two species on this. So if you want to give your guess as to what species we have up here, um, there's a couple different nut hatches here. The white breasted nut hatch. Yes, that was our original one. And that is one of our more common backyard birds. Um, and it does migrate a little bit, especially the young of year. They're going to be moving around this time of year. Now we have the other Michigan nut hatch on here. Does anybody know what this other one is? It has um, a black eye line. Um, the other one is red-breasted Rebecca. Good job on that guess there. Um, nice quick typing there. Nice job too, Angela. So we have white-breasted and red-breasted nuthatches. And sometimes when you see these in the field, you're not going to see the breast, right, what they're named after. Um, and so you might just see the head, but knowing that that head pattern, having a black eye line versus just all white around the eye, that will help you identify it, even if all you get is a quick view of the head. So nice job there, folks. Really good job with your observation skills. Um, way to come through with some guesses there. And I appreciate everyone that guessed wrong too, right? Uh, because you know, that's part of it. It's just putting it out there, trying to make some guesses. And birding isn't about getting it right. It's just about having fun um, and, and learning. All right. So here's another one. Don't do not say what species this is yet, but why don't you start by giving me some observations? What are, oops, what are some observations? So structure, pattern, relative size, behavior, location. So yeah, we, we're seeing a much shorter bill, right? Relative to the head size. It's a pink bill. That's kind of unique. It's a itty bitty beak. Yeah, it's very triangular, right? Stubby is a, a good descriptor there. Um, it has dark eye. Yeah, dark eye led right into dark head. Um, you know, small is kind of a tough to judge here, but yes, this is definitely a smaller bird. Um, no wing bars, right? Um, that's a good observation there too. It's got a white belly, a very white belly, but the rest of it's obviously quite uh, dark. It's a stoic bird. I like that. <laughs> this one is very stoic looking. Uh, behaviors can change over time, but uh, yeah, so some good observation there. It's got a really small head. I think that's a good indicator for the group of birds that this is in. They tend to have almost like no neck and these very short heads. And this is a bird that Cindy knows means winter is coming because this is a bird you probably did not have downstate. Even in the UP, although they breed up here, um, you probably didn't have them at your feeders. They're frequently ground feeding, so that's some good behavior there. Good behavior. Um, so we're we're not sh we're not sharing the name yet, but um, yeah. So these are great observations. And if you know more about this bird, you'll know that it actually is a ground feeder often. So these are all really helpful things. Now, what group of birds might this belong to then? Uh, what group of birds? So we've got a few guesses. That's actually more down to the species level there. That's good. Um, but they. What we're talking about, what group of birds are, are this one possibly? So small birds that are, are short 
headed and short necked and no worries we're all learning here together um finch is a great guess right because they have pretty stubby bills but a finch normally has a little bit more robust of a bill it's actually normally a little bit broader for crushing things um so sparrow would be the other one sparrows and finch is very very close but yes and songbird is actually a, even a more generic group that is also right tk so this is a songbird and if we want to get a little more specific group it's it belongs in the sparrows now this is a sibley bird guide here and this has all the sparrows on it now this bird is not you're not going to see this bird exactly in the sparrows here um this is just um you know a, a big overview of all the birds and i don't have annotation on here so i can't cross them off but um you know basically if you start looking at these birds for pink billed birds, that's a really unique feature. There's only a few that have pink bills. So the juncos have pink bills, the white crown sparrow and Harris sparrow, the field sparrow. Um, so that kind of narrows us down, pink bills. The two-tone color, the white belly, um, we see that on a few. Uh, so that kind of helps with that dark colored back. We don't have a lot of dark colored backs except for maybe the juncos and the towhees. Um, so we could flip to the towhees and the juncos, but if we flip to the juncos, we see that um, there's only a couple juncos. There's there's uh, yellow-eyed junco and dark-eyed junco. And the dark-eyed juncos actually have a lot of variety. Um, but see if you can pick out uh, the dark-eyed junco subspecies that's here. So subspecies have a lot of variety. And this is where fall gets tricky, especially because you get a lot more variety. But does anybody know which kind of subspecies here? Can anyone pick it out? You can type it in now. Go ahead and type the name of this uh, subspecies of junco here if you know which one. There's a few that you could guess from. Take a look there. Yeah, we've got some guesses coming in. So slate colored there. Yeah, so there are a lot of varieties of juncos. Um, white winged is pretty similar here, uh, but this is a dark eyed junco of the slate colored subspecies race. There's uh, the juncos out in Oregon look totally different. Um, they're really unique. They have more, a lot more brown to them, um, but this is a dark eyed junco the um, slate colored subspecies. So good job, folks. You're getting back into that practice or, or you've been practicing all summer or this is new and you're just automatically already good at it of doing observations then sort of thinking about what group of birds, getting your guide out and then sort of looking through that group. And that's kind of the general um, route we go. All right, we're gonna do one last one here. And this bird is actually gonna have some behavior here. So don't say what species. Um, but rather, uh, and I do have a group already listed out there for you, but what are some behaviors you see in here? Let's just practice that identifying features here. So what are some uh, features? So it's making noise, that's good. Um, that's a behavior that we haven't seen before. And yeah, it has that kind of tail pumping or that tail flicking going on. And that's really a, a, a unique feature. Yeah, it's cocking its head when it chirps too. Not all birds do that. Um, and so, it is a perching, it's perching too. Perching birds or songbirds, passerines is a group. So if it has feet that allow it to perch and grab on, um, you know, that is another good indicator. So that pumping tail though, that's just an example of a behavior that can right away narrow it down. There's only about two or three species of birds that pump their tails like that. Palm warblers are one. Um, Wagtails, actually they more wag them, are another one and they're very rare. And Phoebes are the last one that pump their tail. So out of this group here, which Phoebe do you think this is? You can throw that in the chat now. Those are very subtle white wing bars on there, um, Rebecca. Yeah, that's a good, a good note. They have almost wing bars, like a wisp of a wing bar, especially when they're younger. Um, we don't see that so much. But does anybody know what species of Phoebe this is? This would be the only one we have in the state of Michigan. Yes, it's the Eastern Phoebe. So you can see that kind of has that yellowish wash on the underside of the belly. Um, it has a kind of a whitish throat compared to the black Phoebe that has a black throat. A Sage Phoebe, you know, has doesn't quite have a white throat. It's more gray. And so that leaves us really with the Eastern Phoebe. So good job there, folks. That is the Eastern Phoebe. Um, all right, uh, one more, one last one. We're, we're at the last, second to last slide here, um, and we're gonna have some time for Q&A again. But again, one more round. 
let's see some observation, folks. Don't say the name of it yet, but let's just put in some observations there. Ah, wading. Yes, that is a good observation. Habitat is really important for this group of birds. Oh, it has that bold red eye and you know, that reddish pinkish eye that's really popping out there. It's looking for snacks, Liam. I love that. It's definitely looking for some tasty snacks in that water. Um, sharp beak, that long beak. Yeah, that's a, it's like a nut. It's like a blade almost, right? Um, long feathers on the head. That's a good one there, Sarah. That's a subtle one. That's especially in the breeding for this, but it, yeah, it definitely has that dagger-like beak. It's got yellow legs, you know, that's pretty important. Um, it may, uh, you know, not exactly look yellow if they're stained or they're covered in mud, um, but if when you do see those colors, it's really helpful. It's kind of got that dark back and that lighter inside color. It's got that um, red eye again that's really particular. So this is a species of heron. So when you see birds with long legs wading in water, that kind of helps you key into the herons or cranes. And so if we pull up, um, uh, a list of herons and cranes, we can kind of start trying to rule out which one this is. So this is uh, most of the herons and cranes we might have around here. And there's not too many to pick from, but we can see this has got definitely that kind of two-toned color. So that might rule out things like the egrets and um, that are all kind of uniform in color. That The American bittern and least bittern are a lot more striated in their color. Um, so if you wanna give your guess, go ahead and give your guess as to what species this is. Ah, uh, yeah. Angela, you are fast typer. <laughs> You're getting those in really quick there. You too, Sarah. Um, so these are definitely, uh, this is a black crowned night heron. So this is another species that's going to migrate away here. It's heading south. And it's a pretty secretive species. So the fall and spring are good times to try to get a uh, look at these guys. And this is a really cool one. It's very similar to the yellow crowned night heron, but of course it doesn't have a yellow crown. It has that black crown. It also has a lot lighter underside compared to a little bit darker underside of the yellow crown night hair. So well done, folks. Um, I hope that was a bit of a good refresher for you. I did just want to throw out if you're new to birding, this is your first class. Um, you know, this can be overwhelming at first, especially when you're not familiar with your field guide yet. So the Merlin Bird ID app is a great resource if you're a new birder. This is an app that you can download on your phone for free. It has an entire bird guide in it. it has pictures of every species plus their calls. So you can just look through stuff. Um, but it also has some cool features like it asks you five questions about what you saw and then gives you a short list. So you're not so overwhelmed by all 500 birds of the Eastern US or something like that, right? It also allows you to upload pictures or to record sound and give you its best guess. I will say it is not 100% accurate. It's not even close to 100% accurate, especially on the photo ID and sound ID, but it is a really powerful tool that can really help you narrow down. And then when it gives you suggestions about what you saw, you can cross-reference that with your field guide or with other experts, put it up on Facebook and ask around. Um, those are good ways to get a second opinion, but it's a really good place to start. Um, <clears throat> one last thing, um, this is just some common pitfalls. Sometimes we're over relying on cover color, especially in the fall. This can be really challenging because colors change. They get washed out. Birds' weathers get feathers get worn. Um, so don't try to rely too much on color. Size can be hard and our memories can be fickle. So make sure to write it down. But in the end, it's okay not to ID every bird. Remember, this is about a hobby, enjoying it. It's not, doesn't need to be stressful. You don't have to ID every bird. Um, you'll get there eventually to the points where your skills will keep growing and make sure to have fun. So with that, uh, I'm just gonna leave a crazy rarity here, a Barrelin hummingbird that was found at Grand Marais uh, up in the UP. Fall is an awesome time to see rare birds that shouldn't really be in Michigan, they get lost. Um, it's already happening down in Florida with the hurricane, it's pushing birds in. And so um, we'll talk a little bit more about rare birds next week, but I just wanted to leave you with that. So. With that, um, we are gonna take questions. We have a good 15 minutes here to take some questions. So uh, really uh, important, uh, Florence wants to know, what's the bird in the background of your presentation scheme? Ah, yes. Anybody know what this bird is in my background here? So it's a it's a small, uh, yeah, pretty small, um, uh, you know, kind of, precise bill. It's got a relatively long tail. Goldfinch is a good guess, but a goldfinch has more of that conical finch-like bill. Kinglet and warblers are good guess because that is what this is. It's a warbler. These are the kind of birds with really spindly legs. Um, it's hard to get a sense of size from this one. It has a wisp of a black mask. You kind of see that. Um, yellow warbler is a good guess, but yellow warblers don't have any black on their face. This is a bird that has just a wisp of a black mask. In the spring and summer, it will have a bold black mask, but now in the fall, that's kind of subdued. Um, so it uh, also has a very yellow uh, 
what do we have this here? What's that? What's that here? A yellow throat. Common yellow throat. This is a common yellow throat. Yes. So the common yellow throat is a, a warbler species of the marshes, the great um, species. And I just wanted to put that up there as a fall example. All right. <laughs> I can't just answer a question. I got to quiz everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, Jane says an Eastern Phoebe's nested on her uh, house for four years, but not this year. Will they come back? Well, you know, birds are... Um, Sometimes they have site affinity where they return to the same site over and over. Um, now, birds don't live that long. <laughs> so four years is quite a good run for a Phoebe. It may have passed on. Um, you know, birds like that tend to maybe live 10, 12 years at the most, um, but often much less than that. So could have moved on, uh, but it may have just taken a different spot to nest this year too. Birds do not always nest in the same place every year. Uh, and so sometimes they um, might choose a different nesting site that maybe has more resources that summer. Maybe there was a bug outbreak in your neighbor's yard. And so they chose to nest over there to feast on those bugs and they may be back next year. Either way, um, Phoebes are, are like nesting around houses or on houses. So if you keep good habitat, and we'll talk about next week about how to make your backyard a good habitat for birds, um, you'll probably get those back at some point. Stacy's wondering um, if you should change the type of food or seed that you have for winter. She uses suet cake, safflower and songbird seed mix for summer. Uh, mm. And in spring, she has sunflower seeds. Um, but yeah. wondered if she should uh, That's change a really great, great question, Stacy. So feeding the birds is super helpful and important. Um, and even in the fall, there's a kind of a misconception that if you feed birds in the fall, they won't migrate. That's basically not true. Um, you do want to feed the birds. And especially this year with the Canadian wildfires that have been adding a lot of stress to birds and bird migration, um, having feed out for birds might be a good extra boost. Um, you don't necessarily need to change what you're feeding in the fall, but you may need to change how often you clean your feeders. Um, in the summer, for example, with hummingbird feeders, you need to change that hummingbird nectar sometimes every day or every couple of days because it molds really fast. As it gets colder, um, you may not have to change it as frequently, but you may also have birds eating your seed a lot faster, so you may have to fill up your feeders faster too. Um, you can pretty much provide the same things, but it's easier to feed suet, which will rot a little bit faster in the summer. You can feed suet in the fall and winter a lot easier. So I tend to just not have my suet out in the winter, in the summer, because I don't have the time to go out and change it every couple of days, but I'll put it back out in the fall as the temperatures cool down a little bit. Um, and so that can be, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to change anything. Uh, you can feed the same stuff, but it may just change how often you have to um, clean and change out your stuff. You know, mealworms and hummingbird feeders are some unique things you can feed if you really want to attract insectivores, things like bluebirds that aren't going to come to your seeds. They might come to your mealworms, although everything else will also love your mealworms. <laughs> and hummingbird feeders, um, oftentimes people pull them early, again, thinking that the hummingbirds won't migrate. Um, <clears throat> leave them out as long as you can until basically they're starting to freeze. Some hummingbirds will be late migrants and really dependent on those hummingbird feeders to keep them alive. Rare hummingbirds also show up later in the fall, like in October sometimes. So you may be the person who finds a super rare hummingbird that got lost and you might have the feeder that keeps it alive. Well, we have a question about that that uh, Stephanie put in. Uh, if birds get lost, um, do they survive? Or who do they hang with? Yeah. So. There's a lot of unknowns about that. It's called vagrancy in birds. Um, so birds can be lost for a variety of reasons. Um, right now, the hurricanes in Florida are actually pushing a bunch of uh, flamingos out of the Caribbean up into Florida. Lots of reports all across the state. Um, so weather patterns can disrupt birds. Wildfires and other drought can disrupt bird migration. And um, you know other things too, like human-caused interference. Uh, what happens to those birds, though, we don't always know. Um, only recently with this new technology where we can literally track birds in real time or we get an idea for that. And we do find that some of those birds make their way back on course, and particularly those that might get blown off or lost off, um, off course. There was a good study that showed some geese, some white-fronted geese that hit wildfire smoke um, last in 2020. Um, went out of their way and they actually took twice as long to migrate, but they still made it to their destination. They just had to go around some of those big plumes. Another study from a bird that was disbanded actually this summer, a Ferruginous hawk in Ontario, um, that bird 
kind of kept being lost on the East Coast, but has slowly started to work its way back, back to the West Coast. But not all these birds are going to survive. A lot of them don't, the lost birds. Um, birds that have their internal compasses reversed or things like that, um, they may not make it. And that's, you know, just the reality of a bird's life. Uh, being, being a bird is, is a hard thing to survive. How are uh, the birds affected by the air quality due to the wildfires in Canada? Yeah, so actually I was, uh, I'm going to throw a slide in that in next week's presentation, um, but I've just read a few articles and there's not a lot of study on this, um, but basically the smoke is bad for birds. Uh, it's bad for us if we're breathing in. It's so much worse for the birds because birds have highly efficient respiratory systems that absorb a lot more oxygen out of the atmosphere than our lungs can. That also means they're absorbing a lot of other pollutants that are in there. So it really can lower, smoke can really lower um, breeding success for birds. Uh, it can cause them to cough. It can um, disrupt their feeding patterns. Uh, it has a whole host of problems. And there's only a few researchers that are really researching smoke impact on birds, but smoke can really negatively impact birds. Also just habitat loss can really uh, negatively impact birds. So it's huge swaths of boreal forest burn where they those birds would normally nest. They're gonna not have that nesting. And that's really what happened for large portions of uh, Canada this year. Um, the birds are really struggling this year. So if there was ever a year to do things to help migratory birds, which we're going to talk about next week. Um, you really want to do that. Turn your lights off, keep your cats indoor, feed the birds when you can, keep those feeders clean, um, you know, reduce pesticide use, all the kind of normal environmental conscious things. These are going to really help the birds because they are going to struggle. Now, that being said, fire is not always the worst thing. Uh, fire is necessary for some ecosystems. And in fact, the boreal forest is prone to fire and birds know how to get around that. Birds like Kirtland's warbler are dependent on fire to burn jack pine forest. But the problem is that our fires right now are climate change induced and they're much bigger than a normal forest fire would. Or sometimes there's fuel that's built up for too long. So, so human induced changes to fire have caused worse problems, um, but, but birds are adaptable. So uh, it's sort of a both and. <laughs> Um, so Liam wants to know about, uh, wanted to ask about bird families. Are darters closely related to herons or do they look similar phenotypically? <laughs> phenotypically. Yeah, Liam, you, you, you know your stuff. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> so phenotypically would just be the sort of physical expression of the genes or the physical kind of nature of a bird. Um, and so darters are, if, if, if we're, we're a darters are not a bird that's in the U.S., but I think it's like an anahinga um, or a, a cormorant. And so they're more closely, if, if, if I'm remembering what the like Australian and African darters are, they're, they're closer related to a cormorant than a heron. Um, and herons and cormorants are not that closely related, um, but they, they aren't as far apart as, say, you know, herons and... I don't know, falcons or something. <laughs> so, you know, they, they are not, if, if it's the darters I'm thinking about, they're more closely related to cormorants, but not totally far away from hands. Um, other than the hawk watches and the crane festivals, are there any other birding festivals in the fall? Not in Michigan. Now there are in other states for sure. And um, the, um, American Birding Association has a great festival website where you can see <clears throat> um, some of the festivals that are all across the country happening in the fall season. Michigan does not have any major birding fall festivals. It's kind of a bummer. If you want to start one, let me know. Maybe I'll help you out. Um, but we do have Crane Fest. We also have Michigan Audubon offering two weekend tours up in the UP. I'm leading one in October. Um, so that's an opportunity. Those are small tours, about 13, 15 people. Um, they do cost money. Uh, and then you can also look at your local Audubon chapters. So there are state Audubon and then there's local chapters of the state Audubon. And those chapters will offer a variety of birding outings. You can also look at places like the Kellogg Bird Sanctuary or in the Michigan Bird Observatory um, or Detroit Audubon, <clears throat> My Birds. Uh, there are there are lots of groups out there, and uh, the Michigan Audubon website is a great place to start to find your local chapter and see what trips they're offering in your own region. Um, in your presentation, you displayed a map that uh, showed the Muskegon wastewater. Yeah. Uh, and it was south of 
is that southwest Michigan? What is the location on the map you just displayed that was south of Muskegon Wastewater? It oh, yeah. Like it was in I didn't have that one Michigan labeled. Um, so <laughs> there we go. So the Muskegon Wastewater is up in Muskegon. I actually don't think that pin is exactly at the right spot. But um, south of there is <laughs> um, right down near New Buffalo is Tiscarini Park. You also have... Um, uh, Holland State Park, and then you have Warren Dunes. And these are all nice spots to see um, migration happening. So Warren Dunes is a great state park, awesome place to walk around, beautiful, really good migration spot. You can stand up on some of those dune areas and see hawks migrating by. Tiscarini Park um, down in New Buffalo is just a little park, but it's got this jetty that sticks out into the lake. And it's a really good spot to see migrating waterfall. And so anywhere where you have those jetties sticking out, um, Ludington, Grand Haven, Holland, Muskegon, um, those places kind of stick out in the Lake Michigan a little bit farther. Um, you don't get kind of the points like up in like Leelanau Peninsula or Tawas or stuff. Um, and so you don't kind of get that major concentration where birds are crossing the water, but they do get funneled along that lake shore there. Well, we are at 815 folks and uh means that I'm going to have to, to cut Elliot off. We've got a couple of questions we weren't able to get answered yet, Elliot, um, but we will, uh, I'll let you be able to take a look at them and maybe we'll be able to uh, send some, some emails out. But I do have one last question. Have you ever done a big year and what was your count? Or if you haven't done a big year, I'm going to add this part in. What's your life list at right now? <clears throat> well, um, my my world life list is somewhere around 700 or something, but um, my my state life list is at 363. So I'm at 363. I'm hoping to get to 400 in the next few years. That's a big milestone for Michigan. And I did do a Michigan big year. I've done a couple uh, a few times. And my Michigan big year, my biggest one was 287 in 2014. Uh, 300 is this kind of threshold that you're trying to get at as a big year in Michigan. It used to be really hard to get. Now there's so many more birders that like dozens of people hit 300 every year not dozens but you know two or three or sometimes up to 10 so it's gotten a lot more competitive as there's been more birders over the last 10 years but um yeah so <laughs> that's my tie uh, thanks for you jennifer thank McGuire. you everybody for coming sure appreciate it we will see you next week i will be sending out a recording don't forget thanks for joining us bye-bye everybody bye